Uh, my name is Ross Eisenbray. I'm the Vice President of the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, today's panel is about uh, the, the competition in politics and especially federal politics between balancing the budget and making the needed investments uh, that, that uh, the American people want and deserve. Most of the big issues facing the nation uh, will require massive public investments. Uh, $60 billion or more for early education, child care and pre-kindergarten programs, plus after school care, 30 to $60 billion a year in energy investments, alternative energy programs, infrastructure investments that uh, for public schools alone could require $100 billion. Uh, National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, college access for every kid with the brains and, and uh, ambition to succeed. We have all of these needs and current investments, current operations needs that haven't been uh, fully paid for for years. The Legal Services Corporation is funded at about 40 percent of the level that it was in real dollars in 1980 and we have 50 percent more eligible people who need the services of the Legal Services Corporation. The same thing for labor law enforcement, for the FDA, and on and on. So the question is, will a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress be willing to make these needed investments? Will they be willing to raise taxes enough to pay for all of these and, and many other items that, that you'll hear about from this panel? And can they do this all while balancing the budget as they plan to in 2012? Do they have to balance the budget? Is that even a good idea? Does, doesn't it make sense for the federal government to do what every family in America does, borrowing today to make the investments for a better future? These are uh, the issues that, that will be dealt with by this panel today, and uh, it's a very distinguished panel. I'll introduce them each individually before they speak, starting with Congressman Jerry Nadler from New York's 8th Congressional District. He's in his eighth term. He's the sixth ranking Democrat on the House Transportation Committee and the chairman of the Judi Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. Before his term in Congress, he served in New York State Assembly where he was honored as the only assembly member of the year by the National Organization of Women. And the only male. Assembly. The only male. <laughs> yes, that's right. He, he was on, on the ACLU's honor roll. And you can see why from his reaction to 9-11, which struck his city, killed a number of his, of his constituents, and led to a panic in Congress. He didn't panic. He didn't vote for the Patriot Act. He didn't vote for the war resolution, and uh, he deserves, you know, everybody's lasting respect for that. But he's also, today, he's here because he's an expert on public infrastructure, on, on urban infrastructure and transportation issues, and is one of the leaders in Congress on making the important decisions on future investments. Congressman Nadler. Well, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much. Many people say that the first symptom that the Roman Empire was decaying was, was that they couldn't maintain the roads. The Roman Empire was built, they, they built the roads uh, not because they wanted great commerce, they built the roads so the legions could march swiftly to different uh, provinces and put down rebellions and so forth or get to the frontiers and deal with barbarians. But when they couldn't maintain the roads and they started deteriorating, and decaying, that was the first symptom uh, of the decline and eventual collapse of the Roman Empire. We are doing that in the United States today. I mean, if you look and, uh, at, at infrastructure, and the chairman just mentioned some of the uh, uh, key infrastructure deficits. You know, when President uh, Clinton uh, ran in 1992, he said we had to deal with three deficits. We have to deal with the budget deficit. We have to get it under control, he said. He did not say we have to balance the budget. That came later. He said, we had to get it under control. We have to get the trade deficit under control. And it's exploded. 
and we have to get the infrastructure investment deficit under control. We have to invest in human infrastructure and physical infrastructure if the economy is going to function properly, if it's going to be uh, efficient. Let me talk for a few minutes about the deficit in, in, in investment and then talk about the budget. Um, investment. In 1997, now we have a huge investment in highways, bridges, mass transit, and the economy can't function without those things being adequate. If you can't get goods to where they're going, then the economy can't function, not to mention people. Um, in 19, we pass a major transportation bill, a transportation authorization bill, generally every six years. In 1997, we passed the, the, the T21 Act, uh, which was the six-year bill. And in it, uh, we mandated that the Department of Transportation should tell us by 2002, the year before we had to do the next bill, what it would take in the ensuing six-year period in federal investment to keep the highway and bridge and mass transit systems at a state of good repair. Not any great new investments, not any new uh, mass transit systems or new highways, just keep the system in good repair. They came back in 2002 and told us it would take 200, uh, I'm sorry, $375 billion in federal money over the ensuing six year period. So the committee, the Transportation Committee, prepared a $375 billion bill. Until the administration came along, the Bush administration and said, the President will veto any bill above $256.4 billion. Not $255, not $260, $256.4. Why $256.4? Because that was the amount of money expected to be brought in uh, over that six-year period by the gasoline tax. And when we had a conference committee on the bill a, couple, a year later, Chairman Thomas, of the ways, former Chairman Thomas, now former Congressman Thomas, former being the operative word, um, explained the administration principles and said we should not vote a bill that diverged from these principles lest they veto it. What were the principles? One, no general revenues for transportation, only the gasoline tax, and two, no increase in the gasoline tax. Now the gasoline tax is not a sales tax, it's not a percent. It's 18.3 cents a gallon, which means unless you increase the gallons consumed, the revenue doesn't increase. And we don't want to increase the gallons consumed. We want it to go down. We're in favor of energy conservation, energy independence. But what that means is assuming that you keep your consumption the same, you don't bring it down, it means $256 billion for this six-year period, for the next six-year period, for the next six-year period. And given inflation, it means a constantly declining amount of money for investment in your physical infrastructure, which means eventually your physical infrastructure has to collapse for lack of maintenance, a great set of principles. I suggested then, I proposed an amendment to illustrate Mr. Thomas's principles. I said, well, if we're going to go along with the administration's principles, let's do it rationally. Let's mandate the DOT secretary to divide every transportation asset in the United States into two classes, class A, which we'll maintain, and class B, which we won't put any money into and will close as they collapse. Because obviously a larger and larger percentage of our system is going to collapse if we don't have enough money to maintain it. Let's do it rationally. and in. In, in, in some sort of um, um, priority order instead of doing it randomly and letting the, the George Washington Bridge collapse. Uh, he didn't want to hear that, obviously. Now, the fact is we have to spend an immense amount of money. In the next six-year period, we'll do another bill in 2009, we're looking at at least 450 to $500 billion uh, of federal money if we want to, and that's just for physical interest, the highways, bridges, roads, and mass transit. It's not even counting your rail freight. It's not counting education. It's not counting energy. It, that's just your physical transportation infrastructure. And if we don't spend that money, the country will get less uh, efficient economically and eventually less connected, and we will, our economy will become less competitive with others. We must spend that money. Now, we're going to get it. And, and uh, the chairman mentioned other things, human infrastructure, human capital. We've got to spend the money in investment. We've got to have the, the top internet wiring that we don't. Uh, in this country compared with others uh, if we want to keep our economy competitive. Now, notice that the President Clinton in his campaign in 1992 uh, said we have to get the budget under control, the deficit under control, not balance. I am opposed to balancing the budget. It's a heretical view, but I don't, it is not necessary. In fact, it's harmful to balance the budget, as was intimated, since we, the federal government, unlike any corporation, unlike any state or local government, does not separate out an expense or budget for day-to-day -day expenses like teacher salaries and a capital budget like, uh, you know, for building 
uh, bridges, everything is in one. Normally, normally you have those two budgets. Uh, New York, my own state, for instance, passed a balanced budget amendment to its constitution in 1847. We're right up to date. But that was for the expense budget. The capital budget, you finance by borrowing. And you pay it back by an element of expenditure in your expense budget. And of course you borrow money. To, to have one budget, which the United States government does, no capital budget, no expense budget, one unified budget, and then to say you shouldn't run a deficit is to say you should never borrow money for anything. And that makes no sense at all. Um, so you should borrow money reasonably. And I would say that it is perfectly okay to have a budget deficit sufficiently small so that as a percentage of the GDP of your total economy, the total debt, that is to say the accumulated deficits minus whatever has been paid back, is either keeping still or declining to a reasonable percent. And what a reasonable percent is of the, of the GDP you can debate, but you want the debt service portion of the annual budget to be a reasonable percent so it doesn't drag down the rest of the budget in terms of expenditures. And you could probably, when I last looked at these figures about six years ago, that break-even point where you could have a deficit and keep the debt as a, as the, as, as a constant uh, percent of the GDP was about $160 billion a year. So you could run a deficit of about $160 billion a year and not be increasing your national debt or your burden as a percentage of the GDP. Now, having said that, that's not the politics. Uh, people have gotten into their heads, and, and it's interesting, parties change over time. When I was growing up, we always thought of the Republican Party as the green eye shade party. They were the guys who didn't care about expenditures, they didn't care about uh, schools, they didn't care about uh, Social Security. All they cared about was the accounting books. If you were an accountant, you became a Republican, and you balanced the budget, and that's all that mattered. Now, that's been taken over by the blue dogs. The conservative wing of the Democratic Party has that attitude. And that's a drag, from my point of view, on the Democratic Party, because I don't agree with that. I don't think we should, as I said, balance the budget all the time. Now, there's another thing going on, which is not the blue dogs, but is, has governed a lot of what has happened over the last few years, and that's Starve the Beast. How many people here have heard of Starve the Beast? All right, so a number of you know of it. This was originally coined, I think, by David Stockman. Um, and the theory was that the Leviathan federal government is too big, you've got to starve it. Somebody noticed that if you get up, as Republicans did for 40 years more or less, and said, you know, it's nice if our kids go to school, but we can't afford it, so let's not spend too much money on schools. And it would be nice if the middle class had affordable housing, but we can't afford that either, so never mind. And it would be nice if we had uh, Social Security, but we've got to cut that out too because we just can't afford it. You might win a prize at the American Enterprise Institute, but you tended not to get elected. <laughs> you tended not to have a great political success with that line of argument. So the people who really were opposed ideologically to the federal government being having a major role, which is what they really, which really was about, they finally realized that they weren't going to get anywhere and they weren't going to lower the size of the federal government or even restrain it by being direct about it. So they invented the Star of the Beast theory. And the Star of the Beast theory is let's cut taxes so as deliberately to create huge budget deficits. And then that shifts the debate. Then you say, gee, I'd love to have more schools, but my God, we got a $100 billion budget deficit, so we, we can have two more schools instead of what we need, which is 25. I'd love to have affordable housing, but what can you do? We have a $100 billion budget deficit, and so forth and so on. Deliberately create a huge deficit to do that, and they did, and that's what a lot of these tax cuts are about. Deliberately, uh, it, it's about uh, shifting the entire tax burden to the middle class and the low-income people of, uh, away from the rich, but also about lowering the tax burden and lowering revenues so that as a percentage of GDP, tax revenues to the federal government are a smaller percentage of GDP than they've ever been in recent, I mean, I shouldn't say ever been, but certainly since the New Deal. Um, and this country can be taxed more and should be taxed more, not the people who are having a real heavy tax burden. Um, and we should change the alternative minimum tax because that's hitting middle class people. But the rich people can certainly be taxed more. And by rich, I mean you look at, at not only at income, but you look more, more at wealth statistics because it's even more skewed in wealth statistics. That is who has the money as opposed to um, who has the income, which is more transitory. Um, now the Star of the Beast theory has not really worked. It hasn't, in fact, greatly slowed uh, the growth of government because the political pressures are immense for services. Even the Republicans did uh, 
uh, uh, a Medicare uh, prescription drug bill. They couldn't withstand the pressure. They did it in a, in a stupid way. They did it in a way, not stupid, nefarious. They did it in a way deliberately to bring in the insurance companies and pay them off and pay off Big Pharma. But nonetheless, they did it. And they go out and say, we have a prescription drug program because the political pressure for that w w grew too intense to, to oppose. So the real effect of this starve the beast theory is to, slow, is to stop services somewhat, but more important, to have huge budget deficits. Now this country cannot sustain the huge budget deficits and the huge trade deficit, which is a different matter. We have to get it under control, as President Clinton said, but you have to do it with taxes, um, with taxes properly distributed. Now the Democratic Party at this point is a divided party. It is not a left-wing party, it is a center-left party, and it's a very wide tent. One of the problems we have in Congress now is that we have a Democratic majority. We do not have a liberal or a progressive majority. And in fact, if you study the history, um, the New Deal, which is to say progressive domestic politics, lost the majority in, 19, in the 1938 election, got it back in 1964. Johnson landslide lost it in 1966 and hasn't had it solidly ever since. We pick up a few more seats uh, in the next couple of years, we might get it back again. We're close. But we, but we don't quite have a progressive majority that will go in the right direction on these matters, but we're within sight of it. And certainly the, 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 uh, any progressive political um, um, program should say elect a progressive majority, not just a democratic majority, but a progressive majority, care about primaries, care about who the nominees are, care about where you put the efforts in, you know, which candidates you put the efforts in in the general election, uh, because it makes a difference. But we're not that far from a progressive majority. If we get it, we can have a, a, you know, we can have a tremendous impact on things that have been piling up for a long time. People talk about Lyndon Johnson's political genius, everything passed in 1965 and 66, the Voting Rights Act, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. Well, Johnson may have been a great uh, legislative tactician, but it wasn't his political genius. What it was, was that for the first time in 1964, the Democrats gained 54 seats, and there was a progressive New Deal majority for the first time since, 1960, since 1938, and 30 years worth of stuff, as much as they could get through in two years, passed. We lost 47 seats in 1966. We lost that majority. The Dixiecrat Republican Coalition took over again. We've never quite had it back again. But as I said, we're close now, and uh, if we get that majority, we can do the investments we need we can stop talking about the screwing, screwing up Social Security, which, by the way, is, is, is solvent for as far as the eye can see, despite all the propaganda you have, if you make any kind of reasonable assumptions about economic growth rates. If we have an economic growth rate of 2.4% a year, Social Security is flush forever. You have to assume Depression-era economic growth rates to say we have a problem with Social Security. Medicare, we do have a problem, but not Social Security. But in any event, we can start dealing with the real issues and make the real investments and the real priorities uh, if, if the politics changes a little, and that's our job. Thank you. I think that's my usual when they call the vote. Or when they call the vote. Our next speaker uh, is Jeff Madrick. Uh, to my left, he's the editor of Challenge Magazine. He's a visiting professor at Cooper Union and the director of policy research at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School. He's the author of three books, Taking America, The End of Affluence, and Why Economies Grow. He's an Emmy Award-winning reporter and commentator on television. He has a long career in journalism, including writing for the New York Re Review of Books, uh, as a columnist for the New York Times, and an editor of Business Week magazine. Uh, Jeff is also uh, a key contributor to EPI's Agenda for Shared Prosperity and will be presenting a paper on uh, the, some of the same issues that he'll be talking about here on Friday at uh, uh, EPI's next agenda event at 8 a.m. in the morning. So, <laughs> Jeff Madrick. Okay. Shall I stand up or? Uh, you can have the microphone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. My, those introductions get longer as you get older. It's a little scary. <laughs> Oh, I can't remember some of those things, in fact. Thanks, Russ. Congressman, it's uh, a delight to be on the same day as with you, Beth, as well. Uh, nice to see you. It's, it's great to be, back, to be at a conference. I've been here before called Take Back America. Uh, 
Uh, the theme of my talk today, we, we all want to take back America, I think, from the extreme right wing, and I, in, in my view, indeed, from a lot of the moderate politics that are going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, and I don't want to sound too abstract about this, I'm going to talk a little bit about taking back America from the mainstream economics profession. I think the mainstream, I, I, I don't want to get too Manichaean about this. They're not all evil. Ma mainstream economic theory has done some good in its time. It's gotten carried away with itself. Let me return to that in one sec. I went to the MoMA the other day the day before yesterday, that's the Museum of Modern Art in New York. There's a huge piece of art in this huge atrium they now have in the new building. It's called What Happened to Us uh, by a Romanian artist with whom I wasn't familiar. And I thought it was going to be all about Iraq, criticizing America for Iraq. It was mostly about the economy. And there was one huge diagram and it said capitalism. And under the word capital, there was a little drawing of one person. And under the word ism, there was a mu drawings of multiple people. One person had it all, the rest of us are uh, where we are today. It's remarkable what's happened to us with so little outcry. To me, the, the most remarkable p fact of all uh, it was recently published by a couple of economists, mainstream economists to some degree, in fact, Saez and Piketty. One percent, the top one percent of earners, and the congressman talked about wealth, I'm talking just about earnings in a single year. One percent of earners now earn 20 percent of, uh, uh, of income reported to the IRS. In the mid-70s, they earned 10 percent. 10 percent of all income reported by the IRS. That means they're making now, I don't know, roughly another eight or nine hundred billion dollars more a year than they would have had they made the same percentage that existed in the 1970s. Think what would happen, Congressman, if you could tax some of that, how much money you could get. That's just the top one percent. Let me get on with taking back America from the mainstream economists. Mainstream economists tell us we can't afford to insure everybody. We can't afford to pay for early education. We can't afford to pay for the transportation system we need that the congressman talks about. We can't afford to pay for job training. The mainstream economics tell us, be afraid when wages rise too quickly. They may cause inflation. High wa how did we get to a place in the United States where we're afraid of high wages? Well, wages can rise too quickly in certain circumstances. Let's not be naive about this and make some of the mistakes of our ancestors. But high wages can help enhance productivity. High wages can help the economy, not hurt the economy by reducing profits or causing inflation. And in fact, in fact, America was the high-wage country of the world until the early 1970s. This is virtually, to the extent a, a historical fact in economics can be true at all, virtually irrefutable. Even in the colonial years, the United States paid the highest wages in the world in the agricultural sector. Then, as time progressed in the 19th century, the highest wages in construction. And eventually, even though often those wages were not adequate, the highest wages in manufacturing. And what happened? We became the richest, most powerful, and most productive economy in the world. Something doesn't square up here. What's going on? What happened to us, in the words of that economist? The mainstream economists increasingly, not all, but increasingly tell us Government can't do anything to make things better. It can't stimulate, it can't get the unemployment rate down below a certain level that's naturally set in the economy and so forth and so on. One economist at Nobel Prize winner, George Akerlof, describes them as the five neutralities. Whatever government does will be countermanded by some other activity and you can't, and nothing can happen. Can't do any good. How did we get to this place? I can go on, but the last one is an important one, too. Many mainstream economists, by no means all, tell us the only sure way to growth is to cut taxes. Fred Thompson wrote this in the Wall Street Journal the other day, as if it was written, as if it was a holy script somewhere. It is remarkable, a remarkable comment. The, uh, the fact is that when we started, uh, when we adopted uh, income taxes, for one thing, and higher taxes, 
Um, and I mentioned this in the EPI paper that I hope you'll all be able to get, and which we're, we're presenting at 8 a.m. Friday here in D.C. Uh, income taxes in America, the taxes in America collected by the government represented more or less 2% of the GDP in the early 1900s, and by the end of that century, it was 15% of GDP. Roughly kept going up. What happened to the economy? It grew. It grew into the most prosperous economy in the world. Why was that? Partly because we needed government to grow. Government has always been central to economic growth and development in the United States. Now, economists today look back and they say, well, we had minimal government in the 19th century. Jefferson was a minimalist. No, they, say, they look at the amount of government revenue there was as a proportion of GDP as if that was a relevant statistic. It wasn't. Jefferson was an activist. Jefferson, as you know, bought Louisiana and what kind of, a, a, how much more aggressive a land policy could you have than that? How much more radical land reform? And one reason, it wasn't the only reason, partly he wanted that land because he didn't want the French or Spanish on our borders. But he also wanted that land to make accessible, make land accessible to the typical American, and it worked. And he wanted to get rid of primogenitor and entails, which he succeeded in doing in Virginia. And of course, let's keep in mind, he wasn't uniformly progressive by any means. He was a free trader and an active, a very active free trader. It was Hamilton who was in favor of tariffs uh, uh, and industrial policy. But he was an act, what I'm trying to get across is Jefferson, we had an active government back there then. We had an active government under Monroe and Madison. We had an active government under Jackson. Just because government revenues weren't that high doesn't mean it was an active government participating in the economy. Who built the canals? You know who built the canals. Well, guess what? They were Jeffersonian Republicans in New York State and other states that put up the money to build the canals. On based on, uh, financed by government bonds. Started in 1817 in New York. Finished in 1825. Kept going. Education, by 1830, public education was free in America and it was the best, most active education system in the world. The only com competition was in Germany. It was much better than France and Germany. In 1830, 40 years after the Constitution was signed, we had the best public, wasn't, pri wasn't built by private enterprise, Milton Friedman, just wasn't. Uh, what else, the, can I, the, we subsidized the railroads. We, uh, we created, we, we actually enforced competition in the U.S. We kept companies from becoming monopolies early on in our, in our country, in uh, enforcing competition. We kept open the ability to have corporate charters, unlike England, which restricted their corporate charters to the elite and the aristocracy. Done by whom? By government. I can go on. Who built the railroads and subsidized the railroads? Private capital, but in large part, government. Who built, maybe most important because it is most neglected, who built the sanitation systems that made major cities possible? It wasn't General Electric. It wasn't Standard Oil. It was the low state and local governments built health care systems. <laughs> And the ability to have, to have major cities develop was a, a serious, significant, central source of economic growth in America. And it wouldn't have happened without the development of public health systems. Followed in the 20th century by the public administration of vaccines. How many, I have to laugh sometimes, a bit, some of these younger people, including mainstream economists who talk about the economic, the, the medical miracles now, must not remember standing online, I remember in fourth or fifth grade, for the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel, what a miracle that was back then, you know, and it was fresh in my parents' minds, not in mine, of course, of FDR's death due to polio and so forth. It was a scourge. Who administered the polio vaccine? The government did. So, uh, I think I, I think I'm making my point. Government was central to economic growth. Today, we're told it's maybe necessary, it's necessary, I, I used to think of myself when I did TV this way, because I used to do complicated economics sometimes. I used to think these guys who always wanted entertainment news thought of me as a necessary evil on the air. Today, it seems so many people in America think of government as a necessary evil. In fact, it is the good. If the lesson should have been learned in the 1960s or 70s, it's not the government was bad. It's that bad government was bad. 
and we need gov good government. So here, here's my lesson. We gotta invest in public investment, congressman, as you say, and we gotta start getting the Congressional Budget Office to score the returns on public investment, just like they score under the Republic, uh, Republican management, they score the alleged returns from reducing taxes. In other words, the consequence on future uh, federal tax revenues from reduced taxes. Let's start doing scoring the future tax revenues from investing in early education in K through 12 and making college more available in investing in mass transit systems and so forth and so on. Uh, what would those returns be? Here it's, this is pretty interesting. In early education, which is the best example be, because we know returns are pretty high in early education. A couple of economists have done a dynamic scoring analysis. It's not quite public. Bill Dickens and a colleague at Brookings Institution. And they are finding, the results are preliminary, they are funding, finding that the taxes spent on a good universal early education system will be paid back and maybe even will make a profit investing in early education uh, over time, discounting the time value in money. If we include social returns, think of what early education does. It makes students, there's very good evidence it makes students uh, uh, better workers. It also makes students, uh, we need fewer students who need special education, fewer students get left back, fewer of these people who go to early education programs wind up on welfare, fewer wind up in prison. There are lots of benefits. The most important, of course, is they make more money. And indeed, when they go to school, their parents make more money. Cutting into your territory. Not at all. Uh, but uh, but um, the returns on these programs can be quite extraordinary. And there's a book published by Robert Lynch at Economic Policy Institute, who summarized some of the research in, the, in research in this area. And let me just finish up to give you some idea of the returns you find if you include increased tax revenues, increased incomes, uh, the the lost. Uh, the reduced federal expenditures needed because of all these other benefits. The Perry Preschool Project returns over time, they figure of as much as $17 for every dollar spent. The Chicago Parent Child, seven to one, seven dollars of returns over time to every dollar spent. The ABC Darien Program, three point, nearly four dollars for every dollar spent. Head Start hasn't really been analyzed that way, but probably something similar over time. Now, are these perfect measures? Are they a little over-optimistic? Let's say they are over-optimistic. Let's say ABC Darien doesn't return four dollars to a dollar. It returns a mere two dollars to one dollar. Darn good investment. Find something in the private sector that's as good. This can be repeated time and again, maybe not with such grand, and, uh, grand results, but time and again in transportation infrastructure, in K through 12, if we equalize K through 12, money isn't everything in this, this regard. If we make college a little cheaper, we have a class society because the bottom rungs can't get into the good colleges and you, to get a good job, you gotta get into the good colleges. I can go on and on. The point is this. Government is central to economic growth. That doesn't mean we don't like private markets. That doesn't mean we don't admire the great private companies and the great entrepreneurs. But it does mean that if we neglect the role of government, and if we think we should cut back because of federal budget deficits, we are gonna, we're gonna run down our basic assets in this country. We built those assets, not, in, not only in the 50s and 60s through public investment, but over a couple of hundred years. And to some, uh, to some important degree, we are now living on borrowed time because we stopped making adequate investments in these social, uh, social and public goods. We've gotta begin doing that. Let me second the congressman's uh, uh, point Budget deficits don't matter nearly as much when you spend the money on public investment and Democrats better not hem themselves in uh, 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 and, and indeed better not listen to all the mainstream economists who keep telling them the priority is balancing the budget. The priority, I think, are these social goods. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Beth Schulman, who uh, is a dear friend of mine for, for many years. I first met her when <laughs> she was a vice president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. She's the author of Betrayal of Work, How Low-Wage Jobs Fail 30 Million Americans. And since writing that, or maybe even before that, has uh, had a career of crisscrossing the country, uh, making speeches, educating people from coast to coast uh, as part of uh, the Fairness Initiative on low-wage work that, that uh, she co-chairs, uh, as uh, a participant in the Russell Sage Foundation Social Inequality and Future of Work Projects, as a board member of the National Employment Law Project. Uh, she has appeared on everything from Lou Dobbs to Oprah. Uh, she's written op-eds. Uh, she is one of the foremost educators, I'd say, in America on uh, issues of uh, social and economic justice, poverty, inequality, labor relations, and in particular, the harm that's done to the 30 million uh, people who are, are engaged in low-paid work in America. Beth. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, Ross, thank you. Um, I've known Ross forever, and it's, it's such a wonderful relationship. Um, it's great to be on um, certainly the program with Congressman and Jeff Madrick, who um, certainly is such an expert in this field. I, I wanted to kind of step us back a little bit uh, with regard to this issue, because I think the conversation gets going immediately about whether we should balance the budget or whether we should invest. And I think we need to ask a central question before we even get into that. And that's what kind of an America we want. Um, we can't even answer those questions if we don't know the answer to the kind of America we want to build. Um, if we want a society in which the rising tide does in fact lift all boats, not just the yachts, if we want to ensure real opportunity for all Americans, we need to act in a way that's consistent with those goals. Um, what's happened in the past is these goals and the actions that are consistent with these goals get subordinated to the whole conversation around ballast budgets. Uh, we've seen it again and again that putting needed investments in education and in infrastructure in um, housing, in all the things that we think are important to ensure a broad middle class, get on the back burner uh, with regard to balancing the budget. Um, and one of the things I think that's important is historically, when we've said that something is an imperative in our country, we have found a way to pay for that. Um, certainly, when we talk about defense, I don't hear the conversation about, well, you know, we've got to balance the budget, we can't find money for defense. Um, why, why is it not that providing opportunity for hardworking Americans, that kind of an imperative? We need to change the conversation to ensure that ensuring opportunity for all Americans rises to that kind of an imperative that we all believe. We are, in fact, the richest country in the world, and it seems to me that we certainly have the money to provide those kinds of investments. This isn't to say, and I think it's important um, as progressives, to say that we shouldn't save money. In fact, this administration has been absolutely horrible with regard to fraud, waste, lack of accountability, it seems to me that we should be the party saying that we should ensure that government is accountable. We believe in government. We need to, in fact, make sure the government is more accountable and that what we put out there in terms of our hardworking money is invested in things that help working Americans, not certainly contractors who don't produce or subsidies to the rich or corporate welfare. 
So what should we do? We certainly should roll back the Bush tax cuts. That's an easy one. And we need to make sure that we stop providing subsidies to the wealthy who don't need them whatsoever. As Jeff pointed out, they're the ones who have made it in this new economy. Uh, they're the ones through a whole variety of policies that have become inordinately rich. They don't need more subsidies. They need less. So um, it seems to me that we need to also take on that certainly the Congressman and Jeff mentioned. I think a myth that's out there that somehow spending is a sin. Um, over and over and over again, we've heard the conversation about that somehow spending money, that the government's spending money is somehow bad, that it's bad economics. Well, certainly there is bad spending. I've mentioned a few of these, certainly going to contractors, subsidies for the wealthy, certainly projects that don't pr produce any kind of productivity or any other good in our society. There is bad spending. But spending, spending to invest in people, to invest in infrastructure, to invest in terms of issues that will produce greater economic growth, capital expenditures are good. They're good for our economy. Let's take a business, the prime example. A business certainly borrows money to invest in new technology, in new products, new training for workers, and we would applaud that. We'd all say that this is great investing. This is how businesses grow. This is how they become more competitive. The same thing is with regard to individuals. When we see families invest in a new home or invest in their children's education, we applaud them. We say, this is great, this is important. They're spending to ensure that their children can make a better future. So why isn't it true for our country? We understand that we, when we invest in people, invest in the necessities for people to thrive, that it does, in fact, produce greater economic growth and a better future. If our goals, as I mentioned, if the kind of America we want to create is a broadly shared prosperity, we need to invest. Merely to be competitive in this global economy, we need to invest. We're spending less in terms of investment on our people, on our infrastructure, on our basic social safety net than most other countries. So what do we need to invest in? First, as Jeff mentioned, we need to invest in education. Today, it is only the wealthy, only the wealthy, that has enough resources to provide what their children need to succeed in this economy. Most Americans can't afford quality childcare, early education, good public schools, and for their children to go to college. It is only the wealthy that can. We need to invest in all America's children if we want them to thrive. We need to invest in health care. We have the most inefficient, costly system that fails to provide health care for 44 million Americans. It's time to totally revamp the system and ensure that we have a health care system that's there for all Americans and is affordable and efficient. We need to, in we need to invest in training. Again, it's only the wealthy that can continue to have the kinds of training they need to succeed as we move between jobs. We need to invest in infrastructure, as the Congressman so eloquently stated, and renewable energy. We need to invest in a new unemployment system. My God, our unemployment system is based on the 1950s workforce and economy. It doesn't make any sense in today's economy. People are moving between jobs. Jobs are being outsourced. We need to invest in a new unemployment system that ensures that people have the adequate training to move into a new job, that they have the kind of health care that they need to, to sustain themselves and their family. We need, to, uh, we need to invest in affordable housing. Today, our subsidies go to the very wealthy. Someone who has a million dollar house basically gets subsidized, while those at the bottom don't get the kinds of investment they need to have stable and affordable housing. America needs to provide the tools that America needs to succeed. Today, we're under, under investing in Americans. Just as we 
put investments after World War II that produced the kind of economic growth that we're all so proud of and produced the kind of middle class we're all so proud of, we need to do that today. There's one other issue I think it's important for us as progressive to, to really point out. What are the costs of not investing? What are the costs of not investing? In a recent report by the Urban Institute, for example, they found that the cost of child poverty alone is $500 billion a year, 4% of our GDP. And that's just the beginning. There's enormous cost to not investing. But there's also a moral dimension. We're throwing away human potential if we don't invest in everyday Americans. What kind of a society we will have, what we will have without investing? We'll have the kind of society that Jeff mentioned, continued economic polarization, Americans unable to provide the basics of decent life even though they're going to work every day and every evening. We will fail as a society to live up to our most cherished ideal of opportunity. People who support balancing the budget always talk about their morality, that somehow borrowing is going to be the bat on the backs of their children. I would argue quite the opposite. It is immoral not to borrow to invest in our children and our hardworking families. Without the investment, we will continue to have a society in which only the well-to-do will take part in our prosperity. Investing properly in our people is a necessary first step in ensuring that every American has a part of the American dream. If we fail to invest, we will continue to have a society where we have two Americas. We have an American work in which work does not live up to its promise that every American who works hard can, in fact, support themselves and their family and offers a better future for their children. Thanks. Okay, I, I've been given uh, a bunch of questions from the audience. I'll, I'm going to read them and ask the uh, person who's being addressed to answer. The first is for Congressman Nadler. I'm in full support of a capital budget. However, isn't it true that the process of globalization and outsourcing is collapsing the very means we need to build the infrastructure that, that we would create uh, credit to build? The machine tool rich automotive industry, for example, would play a key role, but it is now being taken over by private financial institutions, private equity funds, and hedge funds. Well, it is certainly true that uh, globalization and our trade policies are helping to de uh, uh, almost empty out the country of uh, manufacturing and other industries, and we should we should clearly revise our trade policies, to put it mildly. I don't know what that has to do with the capital budget. The capital budget is an accounting device. It, it's how you consider the expenditures of government. That makes sense on its own terms. On its own terms. The whole question of globalization and trade is a separate question from that. Um, it, it's, it, it's an area where our policies, in my opinion, make no sense at all. It's been observed that, you know, uh, it, was, it was mentioned that the Jefferson was a free trader and uh, Hamilton was for tariffs. Yes, and that carried over um, for a long time, the Whigs versus the Democrats and so forth. But the fact is that free trade in the 19th century helped build the United States and helped destroy the British Empire. We're more in the position of the British Empire in the 19th century, in my opinion. And we have to sharply restrict uh, our free trade and globalization, or change our free trade and globalization policies. Uh, the next question is uh, for anyone on the panel, but uh, I'm sure the congressman will have something to say about this. Please comment on the effect of several states selling their infrastructure. For example, example Texas uh, and its toll roads, and, and we also know about Indiana selling toll, toll roads as well. Um, I don't really know what the effect of that's going to be. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, states are desperate to get more revenues for infrastructure. And rather than raise taxes, they're looking at shortcuts. And that's what that is, essentially, a shortcut. But what's the, you know, you sell your infrastructure or you lease it long term for 99 years. And in effect, what you're doing 
is allowing a private entrepreneur to lease long term or to buy the, the Indiana Turnpike, whatever the road is, and to raise the tolls faster than presumably a political process would allow a, uh, uh, a state agency to do it. And by doing that, they can put more money into maintenance and make a profit. And what they're really doing is, and since tolls are in effect a regressive tax in many ways, they're increasing regressive tax. Now that's clearly the implication. Beyond that, what the implications are, I'm not, I, I'm not sure. Uh, my own view is that it may make some sense under some circumstances to do private-public partnerships to build new things. To lease out existing assets is not a good idea because all you're doing really is outsourcing uh, decisions that you don't have the political courage to make and putting heavier and allowing the imposition of heavier re regressive uh, tolls and taxes. I, I, I think there's, uh, I, I think public-private partnerships can work just fine. I think the, one, the thing we do have to keep in mind is it, it, there's been this strong, uh, there's strong pressure to deregulate American society. And once you give private enterprise control of what are, assent would, are essentially public rights of way, if you're going to do that, you have to have some kind of regulatory mechanism that seriously works. In the current environment, I'm worried that we can do that kind of thing, so I worry about that. For example, we let cable companies back in the 1980s set any price they wanted, even though they were, by and large, in most localities, uh, pure monopolies. That's just one of many examples of the, the fear of regulation. Uh, regulation of the financial markets is another example. It's one thing to encourage financialization. It's another thing to be uh, fearful of any kinds of regulations uh, that might help us avoid speculative stampedes and disadvantage and conflicts of interest. So I, th I think privatization in that sense is dangerous in an environment where we really dislike regulation. Uh, can anyone on the panel speak about investing in education by shifting much of its financing to the federal level, allowing for more equal and increased funding of public education, and also why not make national service for college or high school grads to include service in teaching and tutoring? Before, please thank Congressman Nadler for his participation. Congressman, get that CBO to score some of these investments, okay? That's right. yeah. I forgot the question. It's, a, it's moving federal education, uh, uh, funding for education more to the federal level, allowing for more equal and increased funding. Education. Well, I mean, one of the problems certainly in our education system we've seen is that, that most of it is through the property tax, which makes it inherently unequal, because obviously the richer areas get a lot more money um, than those who don't. We've seen some changes with regard to some of the lawsuits that have been brought that have equalized it a little bit. But basically, um, we need to ensure that there's a real equality, not only equality, but those certainly um, who are more low income and have other issues when they come into the school system get greater resources certainly than my son who's coming from a situation that has a lot of resources going into it. Um, so one of the ways certainly to do that is one, equalize them in the states and find different you know, funding mechanisms and certainly to get the federal government involved. Uh, the next question is, uh, someone asks, as an economic novice, <laughs> where are simple resources that someone who has no economics background available, where, where are resources available to someone who has no economics background? Where does one begin? The Economic Policy Institute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say our uh, the website. Economic Policy Institute website is a great place to go, www.epi. Org for a, uh, a wealth of information on, on trade policies, um, uh, labor market issues, education, the economics of education. It's a very broad 
uh, range of, of resources. Well, I think, I think uh, I, there are a lot of sources. On public policy issues, there's an awful lot written now. Uh, Economic Policy Institute is one of the leaders in that regard. Um, the web is full of stuff. On, on primers on economic theory, I'm always at a loss about that. I don't think there is a good, reasonable, fair review uh, of what is really a very complex and controversial set of theories. So uh, I'm going to be silent about that. Okay. We, we have a question on how to push candidates, what to push candidates on, and how vis-a-vis -vis the tax issue. How do we get, I assume this means, how do we get our candidates to uh, take, take on these tax issues directly? Well, I think that I, I think we uh, that's the that is the major issue. Uh, I think the Democrats have been frightened to talk about a lot of important issues. One of them, for example, I ran across recently speaking to some people. I, I think the Fed, Federal Reserve policy we target inflation at two percent a year, which means that every time it looks to the Fed like inflation might run a little hotter than that, it steps on the brakes. So why can't we get some presidential uh, contenders to talk about saying, well, why don't we raise the target to oversimplify to 3% a year, maybe step on the brakes a little less frequently, maybe get the economy to run hotter, maybe to get the unemployment rate even lower, because we know a lot of people drop out of the job market, so the unemployment rate's not quite right. Maybe that gives workers a little more bargaining power over time. Maybe that's a key to ways, raise wages. Third rail. Let's not, talk, let's not criticize Federal Reserve policy or suggest they be, be any lower. You know, that's an example. I, I don't have an answer about how to, I, I think all we can do is beat on the door and embarrass them and keep telling them to do it and circumstances will eventually flow in this direction, maybe too late. Look how long it took them to turn against the Iraq war. I, I mean, I think it's one is to kind of talk about how we're gonna in other words, use government to produce the kinds of things that we want to see happen. I mean, part of the problem I think that's happened is we've had bad government producing bad results, and as a result, I think people are kind of fed up at this point. Um, so I think we need to come in and, and show that, in fact, we can produce the kinds of results we're talking about uh, with regard to the kind of investments I talked about earlier and Jeff talked about. You know, there's another way to star starve the beast, and, and starve the beast goes back at least to Milton Friedman and probably before the 50s and 60s, really. But uh, one way to starve the beast in a way is to put really bad people right. in government, exactly. which is what this, yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, I th they, they put, purposely put people in government who don't believe in government right. and try and restrict what government can do and, you know, uh, and undermine a lot of what government can do. And it seems to me even worse, as, as Beth was pointing out, who are so cynical about government that they're willing, you know, to, to be corrupt right and left. We have uh, just a couple of minutes to get to our presidential candidates. Thank I'd you. like to thank the panel for uh, <laughs> their efforts, and uh, I encourage you all to go hear the next two presidential candidates. I know taxes and all these others. <laughs>